Uh -huh. Hey, Douglas, you know, we're on a new radio station now, and a whole new audience wants to hear who you are and why you're so important to this program tonight. So give us a little background, Doug. Well, uh, I think uh, you gave me such a uh, such a stellar little pocket biography there. I don't know how to one up that. I think. So how long? Okay, so you were at the Presidio. What did you do at the Presidio? Well, at the Presidio military base, uh, what I was recognized for was running the ovens, and that was essentially a form of cultural genocide uh, in the sense of destroying the past, taking uh, massive amounts of documentation, not only American documents, but also documents from Axis nations, uh, some documents that had been copied or smuggled out of the Soviet Union, uh, many of them covering extremely controversial topics that uh, were never released to the U.S. public or to academia. And by destroying the past, we're destroying the future. And uh, in a sense, uh, my uh, exposure of what I expose is a form of atonement for that and also a form of vindictiveness. Uh, I certainly had um, 10 years there at the Presidio military base that was... Uh, a, in, in, in a large um, sense, uh, wasted time in terms of career, but very valuable time in terms of preserving history and preserving heritage for all of humanity. Uh, it was the uh, place where the United Nations was founded uh, at the Presidio Military Base of San Francisco. It was the place where World War II ended when Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida uh, came to San Francisco and specifically to the Presidio military base to sign in a United Nations ceremony a peace treaty with the United States. And, um, it, and um, definitely I could go on from there. It was kind of like a, um, a kind of like the precursor to Area 51 back in its day, believe it or not, because that little thin strip of uh, spit sand that's known as Chrissy Fields was actually used to test maritime biplanes uh, in the post-World War I days. And uh, so that's why so much of the U.S. Army Air Corps, which later developed into the Air Force and moved a lot of its covert projects to Area 51, still had an enormous documentary connection with the Presidio military base. So tell me, Doug, you said you had a lot of information about the Soviet Union. Yuri Gagarin, of course, we're, we're recognizing him as the first man in space. And uh, the funny thing is, is that there's actually that dark area of uh, Soviet Russia where a number of cosmonauts were erased from the list. Is there any truth to that? Oh, most certainly. And uh, that's uh, something that all of the communist nations were famous for. Um, you get great examples of like, uh, uh, great examples of that historically would be something similar to uh, Beria, who is the head of the NKVD, the precursor to the KGB. And uh, when Beria fell out of favor, uh, when Khrushchev took over and uh, basically eliminated Beria, they had uh, this huge entry for him in the Encyclopedia Sovietica. And what they did was when they removed his entry with the next edition, they just extended the article on the Bering Strait because that was the closest thing alphabetically to uh, Beria. And you have uh, incidents like uh, General Lin Biao, who uh, rebelled against Mao during the Cultural Revolution. He was in charge of the People's Liberation Army of China. Uh, when he lost his attempt at a junta, he tried to escape to the Soviet Union. Um, somehow, mysteriously, his plane uh, disintegrated in midair, crashed somewhere in outer Mongolia before he was able to reach the Soviet Union. And after that, photos that um, had existed all over China uh, of him and Mao were reissued where Mao stood alone. So th this happens all the time, but it happens here in the West as well. The one thing that you can uh, bet is that people in these totalitarian regimes have a greater sense of awareness that um, history is an uncertain territory. <laughs> well, okay, so... One of the things, I mean, when I first read about the astronauts that were like, you know, and I heard that story about the guy that was uh, erased out in the Mao Zedong, or actually uh, Mao's uh, picture, uh, yeah. they did the same thing with some of the Soviet cosmonauts, and many of them was because they failed at what they were trying to do, and that is land on the moon. Um, right. What kind of stories can you relate to the audience about the, the pre, or actually the, the side of the Soviet space program that we never really saw, that many Americans were unaware of? Well, I think it's important to remember that there's a large part of the American space pro program that we're also unaware of. But in terms of the Soviets and the Americans, everything that they had in terms of their rocket, rocket technology was, of course, derived from the Third Reich. So you bring up an interesting point because you talk about the Van Allen radiation belt and um, you bring up the question of what do we define 
as outer space. The term aerospatial uh, technology is often thrown about, uh, aerospace museum and, and whatnot, but uh, it's a misnomer because space and the atmosphere that we call the air, they're very different mediums, and half of Earth's atmosphere is located less than three miles above sea level. And what do we call the first breakout into space? What would be defined as that? Because uh, when Adolf Hitler in February of 1937 uh, read a copy of Eugene Sanger's Raketenflug Technik, he ordered the Pinyamunde Munde researchers to abandon all projects under development and concentrate on antipodal skip bombers for a period of time. And Sanger was drafted into the research center, and the A-4 ballistic missile the Germans were developing was converted into a booster rocket for the comet-derived antipodal bomber. And uh, it went so far, and Americans are totally unaware of this because all of the extant um, samples or, or models were captured by the Soviet Union because all of this was on the eastern front. But in May 1942, in conjunction with the launch of Case Blue, the summer offensive, Germany began a bombing campaign on the Soviet Union using the Sangers to strike at Soviet trans-Ural industrial bases because Stalin had moved all of his industrial base behind the Ural Mountains. Pure, poor accuracy really limited the campaign's effectiveness, but over time, the attacks took their toll. But ironically, the antipodal skip bombers, which skipped over the atmosphere like a flat stone, skipping over a body of wa- water, they... Um, their design forced them to skip around the world. Are you talking? Are you talking supersonic jets or flying saucers? Is that what uh, you're talking what about? The, what, what these were were these were the basis of the space shuttle, but they were different in the sense that rather than launching at a 90 degree vertical launch using a very large rocket or rockets, uh, Sanger had them t- piggyback just the way the space shuttle does on certain occasions off of the back of very large planes, a winged launch vehicles. So they would launch into what we would call, uh, for the sake of, for the sake of uh, just easy terminology, they would launch into space at mm-hmm. an angle of 30 degrees. But then the argument would be how high and where do we define space as opposed to the stratosphere. But um, these were um, definitely working. They would skip around the world after each attack run, starting high over China and Central America and taking the long way back to Germany. But they did exist, and the Americans were unable to catch, capture a single specimen, but it's one of the reasons why the Soviets were able to successfully beat the United States in the race to get the first unmanned spacecraft into Earth orbit, the first spacecraft crewed by a man, and the first by a woman, why they also uh, deployed space stations for a much longer duration. There's still argument as to who got the first pigeons and monkeys up. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but what we're talking about is essentially the reality that you bring up concerning the Van Allen radiation belt. And where the Soviets faced the problem was the length of time that was spent there. Now, apparently the Germans weren't going high enough to get burned. And uh, when the Soviet cosmonauts were going high enough but not getting through that radiation belt fast enough, they're getting burned. The United States, where they had the advantage, according to what they tell us, if, if they did indeed go to the moon, then their advantage lay in the fact that they went through the Van Allen radiation belt so fast that whatever radiation they got was minimal, right? Minimal would have an effect on them later. Douglas, i got to take a break. Douglas Dietrich's my guest tonight, and he is going to radically restructure your understanding of mankind's race for orbit. In fact, tonight we're talking about the space program because we're celebrating, or Russia is celebrating, the first man in orbit. That's Yuri Gagarin. Secret space programs and suicidal astronauts are just part 